Hi, ladies and gentlemen. This is Mr. Workman and Mr. Gales. We're doing this together today just to give you the last screencast of the year so, we, um, so you have both of us talking at you today. We're going to have a little conversation today about taxonomy, which of course is the science of classification. Isn't that right, Mr. Gales? Indeed it is. Taxonomy is the science of how we classify organisms based on their common characteristics. So what I'm looking at right here um, are six kingdoms as we go across the screen. We see eubacteria, archibacteria, protista, plantae, fungi, and animalia. And that is Latin, which of course provides us with a common language no matter what country of origin we're from, uh, to describe the six main categories or the most inclusive categories of our classification scheme. What's that on the bottom there? What's this domain thing, Mr. Gales? Well, the domain is the largest ca uh, classification category. There's the bell. Uh, the domain is the largest classification category, and as you can see, there are three domains. And the domain, we have the domain eukarya. And if I'm thinking about you, what I've learned this year in biology, a eukaryotic cell is a cell that has a nucleus. So I'm going to guess that all those kingdoms that are included in the domain eukarya probably have cells that include nuclei. Um, then we have the domain archaea. And that word, to me, looks like archaeology or archaeologist, which I know is somebody who studies something ancient. So that's probably some sort of ancient organism. And then there's bacteria. So we have those three domains. And so those are sort of the largest, uh, most inclusive ca categories of uh, taxonomy. So this looks like it's another link, uh, a look at some of those um, major categories, right? We see um, plants, animals, funguses, protists, uh, eubacteria, and bacteria. But to me, this looks kind of like a tree, Mr. Gales. I wonder why it looks like a tree. We oftentimes hear about the tree of life, and at the trunk of that tree, the base of the tree, we have the common ancestor of all living things today. So if you look at this picture carefully, you can see that uh, all the different branches of the tree represent the major kingdoms, and of course the smaller branches would represent the different groups within the kingdoms. And the closer you are to the trunk of the tree, um, the older those that, that ancestor would be. So obviously things like the, the plants, the animals, and the fungi would be more closely related to each other than they would be to organisms down here at the base of the tree, like the eubacteria or the archaeobacteria. But it's also fair to say, right, Mr. Gales, that plants, animals, and fungi all stem, to continue the tree metaphor, from that same common ancestor at the base of the tree, yes? Yeah, that's correct. Those all, they all stem from that same common ancestor, that earliest instance of common life. All right. So as we look at this slide, it looks like we've got some unique characteristics for an organism uh, in order for it to be considered uh, uh, part of the category we call archibacteria. Yeah, and this is where you're going to want to fill in the chart that we gave you in class uh, with the characteristics. Now, archibacteria, we need to understand some of the terminology here, and you've learned all this terminology throughout the year, but let's kind of review this here. Archibacteria, it says, can be autotrophic and heterotrophic. And remember that an autotroph is an organism that produces its own food, either through chemosynthesis or photosynthesis usually. Heterotrophic organisms are organisms that have to eat something else to get their food. So archibacteria look like they're fairly diverse in this sense that some of them can make food and some of them have to consume food from another source. Unicellular, pretty straightforward. We know that they're all made up of one cell. Prokaryotic, uh, no, cell, no nucleus within the cell. Um, they have cell walls. This is a, a, a characteristic that is uh, important to, to note. Their cell walls lack something called peptidoglycan, and some of the archaeobacteria are mobile, which means they can move around. All right, so if an organism, oh, from what I'm hearing you say, Mr. Mr. Gales, if an organism is not comprised of just one cell, so that means if it's multicellular, it could not be part of this category we call archibacteria. Am I right in my understanding there? Yeah, I think that's right. And, and if we wanted to look at another example, let's say we did find a unicellular organism that was, in fact, prokaryotic, but it had a cell wall that did include peptidoglycan, that would, that would indicate that it would probably be fairly closely related to the archibacteria, but it would be something else. It would be a different type, a different kingdom of life, because even though it's unicellular and prokaryotic, its cell walls would include that chemical. So what we're seeing here is that organisms have to have particular or distinct characteristics um, in order to be classified uh, or defined as classified into a particular category. That's right. And w one kind of cool thing about the archibacteria here, these are the really ancient organisms that are left over from the earliest instances of life on our planet. They live in extreme 
uh, environments. They're called extremophiles. They love the extreme environments. And the picture that you're seeing here on the right-hand side is of a deep sea vent at the bottom of the ocean. And these deep sea vents give off superheated sort of sulfurous water that these organisms use to derive their energy. That sounds pretty extreme. It is extreme. So as we look at this slide, now this is eubacteria, of course, which have, uh, would be similar to archibacteria, autotrophic and heterotrophic, both unicellular, prokaryotic, lacking a nucleus, that is. But now here's our key distinction. The cell wall in their eubacteria has this particular compound uh, molecule referred to as peptidoglycan, whereas if we recall eubacteria, they did not. So that's a key distinction here between true bacteria and the uh, ancient bacteria that we were describing just a moment ago. Yeah, these bacteria are the bacteria that you're most likely going to be familiar with. Uh, e. coli, which we find in, in sometimes in meat, causes food poisoning. And streptococcus, which is a bacteria. There's the bell again. Uh, bacteria which can cause strep throat. Uh, big idea here is they're, again, this huge kingdom of organisms, but they're a little bit different from the archibacteria because they have that different component to their cell wall. So one key distinction or one key difference in a physical characteristic can either include or preclude an organism from one of these major categories. Yeah, that's right. That's the way taxonomy works. So now we're looking at protists, and as I see the list of uh, characteristics common to protists, they're autotrophic and heterotrophic, so they can either feed themselves or feed on other things. Um, many are multicellular, although from looking at that statement, it looks like they could also be unicellular, possibly. Eukaryotic, so that's, that's key here. Um, they have a, a nucleus in their cells. Most do have a cell wall. Some are mobile. Um, let's talk a little bit more about this, Mr. Gales. Yeah, mo the word mobile here, we should mention, refers to the ability for these organisms to move around on their own during at least part of their life. So protists are mobile creatures. You probably have seen protists if you've ever looked at pond water under a microscope. Things like a paramecium or an amoeba would be a great example of a protist. All right. Uh, let's look at another category here, and this is the, the fungi category or fungus category. And I'm seeing a picture of mushrooms here. Yeah, uh, the most common fungus, or what we most commonly think of when we think of fungus, is the mushroom. Um, this is the kind of a fungus is the kind of the, the kingdom of organisms that uh, you sometimes get growing between your toes. We call it athlete's foot, and this is also the kind of organism that people eat. Uh, on pizza. Not not the fungus growing between your toes, but mushrooms. Yeah, I don't think I'm interested in eating any of the fungus that's growing between your toes, Mr. Gales. I don't have fungus growing between my toes. Okay, well, that's a subject for another day. But as I look at some of the characteristics that are going to be unique to fungus, uh, well, not necessarily unique, but required of an organism to be a part of the fungus category, or kingdom, rather, they have to be heterotrophic. So that means they cannot feed themselves, which would indicate to me they do not do photosynthesis. They do not do any type of chemosynthesis. That is, they feed on other organisms. Um, mostly multicellular. Uh, I, I think the fungus that's growing between your toes, Mr. Gills, would be unicellular type fungus, maybe. I'm not really sure about that, but who knows. I do know that the yeast that we use to um, cause bread to rise is unicellular um, fungus, and so too are the yeasts that ferment sugars into alcohol when we brew beer or um, uh, distill um, spirit. Well, after we make wine, we can distill them into spirits and things like that. But that's interesting. Eukaryotic, of course, these organisms must have a, a nucleus in their cell. They do have a cell wall, but now it's made of this stuff called chitin. Is that how we say that word, Mr. Gales? Yeah, that's uh, an important word that you say correctly. If you remember from earlier in the year, we had several students who mispronounced that, and you can get real, you know, into real trouble if you don't say it correctly. I'm not going to verbalize that right now, so as to uh, leave it up on on the video on YouTube forever. But you know what I'm talking about here. Fungus, it looks like they are immobile, which means they cannot move. Uh, another word to describe that would be sessile, I believe. Uh, and I think the spelling on that is S-E-S-S-I-L-E, -S -S -E, sessile. They can't move. They don't move. Um, and they live mostly on decaying organic matter. So maybe that explains why I see mushrooms where there used to be a tree in my front yard. Yeah, when you walk through the forest, let's say you're out at a, a forest preserve this summer. When you're walking around, if you see a tree that's fallen down, you oftentimes see fungus growing on that tree. It's actually absorbing um, the organic material from that tree. So in, in that sense, it's it's eating the tree, so to speak. But really what it's doing is chemically digesting the, the organic material from that. Mm, sounds yummy. Okay, now here we are to our plant kingdom, or plantae, if we were saying the Latin. 
as we see on this list here, plants must be autotrophic. That means they feed themselves. And of course, we're talking here about photosynthesis. They are multicellular, made up of many cells. Uh, they cannot be unicellular, therefore. Uh, eukaryotic, that means they have a nucleus in their cell. Their cell wall in their, uh, uh, that surrounds their cells, of course, is made of this particular type of molecule, which is a polysaccharide we know of as cellulose. They are immobile. Um, and of course, they produce oxygen through photosynthesis and uh, absorb carbon dioxide in that process um, from our atmosphere. We're talking mostly about trees, shr shrubs, grasses, flowers, that sort of thing. Yeah, I just want to point out how cool is it? All the different things that you've learned throughout the year in biology are all coming right here in this one slide. Understanding that autotrophs produce their own food multicellular, we understand cell structure, the fact that eukaryotic means that, a, that it contains a nucleus. Cellulose, you guys all remember cellulose, it's our favorite polysaccharide, right? Uh, it's what paper is made out of. So this is it's pretty cool that you've learned all this stuff this year. Hmm. Makes enough sense to make dollars. Absolutely. Many dollars. Here we are in our final kingdom category of animals. Uh, in order for an organism to be an animal, they must be heterotrophic. So they do not chemosynthesize and they do not photosynthesize. Um, they are multicellular. They cannot be unicellular. Eukaryotic, that means they all have uh, nuclei in their cells. No cell walls. That's a key distinction here. So uh, no cell walls in animals' uh, cells. Animals are mobile, which means they can move around. And of course, things like mammals, insects, birds, reptiles, sponges, even sponges are animals, Mr. Gills? Yeah, uh, sponges are an example of a kind of a sp interesting uh, animal, uh, sort of a coral reef as well. We think about a sponge or a coral reef, you don't really think about them moving around very much because we usually see them with divers swimming over them. But um, all, all animals have to be mobile during at least part of their lifetime. And sponges and corals are mobile during their reproductive phase, particularly when they're immature, and then they become sessile later. Oh, wow. All right. So um, let's look at um, some of our more uh, exclusive taxonomic categories. And of course, if we look at our um, uh, categories that we've discussed previously, we have domain and kingdom, but we have um, more categories that we have in our list here. And an easy way to remember these categories is to remember this particular mnemonic, kings play chess on fine green silk. And those first letters of those uh, words, of course, are also the first letters of these words, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Kingdom, of course, is going to be the broadest or most inclusive category. That means it includes lots of different um, organisms in that category, whereas species would be the most exclusive or most specific. And if you think about the word specific or the word special, uh, they have the same root as the word species. Um, Mr. Gales, maybe we can talk about this particular diagram here and what this is uh, uh, showing us. All right, this is uh, the idea of the classification scheme is that these, these you can think of these classification groupings as sort of like a, a series of nested boxes. In other words, when you look at the domain, the box for the domain, and we're looking at the eukarya, if you remember from our first slide, we know that there were four kingdoms that were included in domain eukarya. And the color of the of those kingdoms, as you can see here, it's kind of a greenish color, which matches the kingdom box. So what this is showing us is that there are four different kingdom boxes within the domain box. If we move down to, whoop, I got to go back. Sorry about that. Uh, if we go back to the, the or if we move on to the kingdom box, what we can see here is the kingdom uh, will include lots of different what are called phyla. Phylum is the singular. Uh, phyla is the plural, and we can see the color here would represent that there are many different phyla within the kingdom. Similarly, there will be many different, got to turn off my mouse pad, there are many different uh, classes within each phylum, there will be many different orders within each class, there are many different families within each order, there are many different genuses within each family, and then each genus might have um, a couple of different species, but each species is, is exclusive. In other words, there's only one type of organism within the species category. We should point out in some classification situations there are subphyla or sometimes subclasses. So sometimes taxonomists cheat and put um, categories in between these major categories too, don't they? Yeah, that will help them to differentiate between organisms that have very common characteristics but are slightly different in one way or another. So this uh, hierarchical system of nested boxes, so to speak, so to speak, comes from this gentleman by the name of Carolus Linnaeus, and uh, you know he was alive during the 
um, 18th century, of course, and he came up with this idea of this two-name naming system, right? Binomial means two name, and uh, nomenclature is a naming system. Um, and so what, when we talk about the two names or the scientific names of organisms, what, what are we talking about there? Well, generally, the scientific name of an organism will include its genus and species name, and that helps to make the scientific name uh, kind of a common name that all scientists can use regardless of their native language. Now, because there are many more species being discovered, sometimes we see that there's actually a, a third name called a subspecies name that could be used. But generally speaking, we can identify organisms by looking at the genus and species name. All right, so let's look at some examples of some particular organisms that um, we can think about and look at their particular categories uh, to which they belong. We're going to look at here two very similar organisms, the human and the chimpanzee. Uh, humans and chimpanzees are 98.4% genetically identical, so we would expect lots of similarities here. You can see that we both belong to Kingdom Animalia and the phylum Chordata. We are both mammals, so we're both in the same class, and we're both in the same order, the order primata, which means we're primates. The family that we belong to is the Hymenididae family, that's a mouthful, um, and that's where we sort of differentiate from the chimpanzees. Humans belong to the genus Homo, and uh, chimpanzees belong to the genus Pan. And then our species name is Sapiens, whereas the chimpanzee name is Troglodytes. So when you put that all together to write the scientific name for humans, we have Homo sapiens. Uh, also notice here that the first letter uh, in the genus name is capitalized, and the first letter in the species name is lowercase. That's typically how we write a scientific name. And if you're handwriting it, you're going to want to underline it. If you're typing it, generally we have it italicized. Um, the scientific name for the chimpanzee is the pan troglodytes. Uh, one interesting side note here is sometimes people will call each other troglodytes as kind of a way of uh, denigrating them. It's a little bit of an insult because they're calling you a chimpanzee if they call you that. Well, I won't do that to you today, today Mr. Gales. All right. All right. Thank you. All right, here we have uh, the classification schemes of two organisms that are much more different. Now, if we look at them carefully, we have the domestic horse and the horsefly, and we chose these because they have sort of similar common names, but their classification categories will be very different. Now, they both belong to Kingdom Animalia, so we know that they are multicellular, heterotrophic, they are, have eukaryotic cells, they move during their lifetime, but that's where the similarities end. You can see that they have different phyla, they have different classes that they belong to, different orders, different families all the way down. Uh, so this is really a, a great example of how the, the more different two organisms will be, the more different their classification categories will be. The other key point to make here is the, the fewer common classification categories two organisms share, the more distant their common ancestor must be, yes? That's true. And then the other thing you, that you should note here is on this table, we see that the scientific name for the domestic horse is given, and we don't see a scientific name necessarily given for the horsefly. The reason for that is there are 4,500 different worldwide species of horsefly, so that are, they're all very similar and all sort of categorized into the same uh, groups. All right. Well, um, that's going to be it for this particular screencast to look for what we do next in terms of... Um, talking about specific types of evidence for the um, fact of evolution by the theory of the mechanism called natural selection. Thanks, everybody. This has been Mr. Workman. And Mr. Gales. We'll see you in class. Street.